Thanks everyone for joining us. We have two wonderful poets with us today, Beth Ruscio and Helena Cardona. Beth will read first and then Helena. Beth Ruscio, daughter of actors, is a published poet, an accomplished actor and perennial student. In earlier days, she was also a bartender, banquet waitress, caterer, executive secretary, and for her first job, she detasseled corn. <laughs> she is the recipient of numerous poetry honors as a finalist for the Wilder Prize, the Sunken Garden Prize, Tupelo Quarterly Prize, and the Two Sylvias Prize. As an actress, she's won the Drama Critics Circle Award, five Dramalogue Awards, three LA Weeklies, and Best Actress at the Method Fest. With her husband, the gifted playwright Leon Martel, she's the co-author of their play, 1961 El Dorado. She's been the facilitator of Beyond Broke's Wednesday Night Poetry Workshop, a mentor at Otis College of Art and Design, and as part of the Hidden Heroes writing slash acting team at LMU. In late 2020, her book, Speaking Parts, won the Brick Road Poetry Prize. It's their all-time bestseller. In his Cultural Weekly Review, John Brantingham wrote, quote, Speaking Parts is an exceptional collection. Beth Ruscio has spent a career acting, and she is able to bring the wisdom of that career with her to show us what it means to be human, end of quote. It has been a delight to read Beth Ruscio's poetry. Her poetry is lyrical, feminine. She is very observant and has an excellent use of metaphor. Some of the themes in her poetry are family, work as an actor, marriage, place. Her poetry is vigorous, playful, inventive, poignant, loving. In her Towards an Uneasy Love for Ophelia, she wrote, quote, Yet, what would I give for a sure and certain place in the chain of being, end of quote. It ends, quote, you darling damned, end of quote. A superlative poet, here's Beth Ruscio. Oh, thank you, Harry. Thank you, Harry. I'm, I'll be glad when they can get your face back on the screen because you're so handsome. Um, and such a wonderful poet. I, I, I'm a groupie of this program. I've been, I came to the party late, but I've been watching it for months now. And it's a wonderful Friday, a Friday event. It's sort of, you know, this hour out of time, I think is how you call it. So without further ado, I'm going to open and close with a love poem and this one actually is for you, Harry, because it takes place in the Midwest. And I think you're from Nebraska. Yep. And I was raised in Iowa for part of my life. And um, so this place, I mean, this poem references Nebraska. Imagine her happy, sitting in your passenger seat, the unwritten you at the story's wheel, all brute aftershave and chrome shiny you driving the buttermilk yellow Camaro out of Omaha, brand new, leather buffed back to beef. On this Midwestern June night, the fecund perfume of skunk, corn floss, manure turned loam, streaming through rolled down windows, you say, I'm going places. And this time she believes you. And at the long stoplight, you kiss her the way you always meant to, parting her chapel veil of heaven scent, soft on the shut cherry of her mouth, you coax open and can still taste will chase through time the whole wide, fragrant future and ahead the road straight as facts. That's for you, Harry. Thank you. It's beautiful. Um, so I, as Harry said, I'm the daughter of actors, and you'll hear from them too. 
Um, but I'm also an actor and a poet, just like Colleen. And I, um, so I'm going to treat you to some of those kind of acting poems. The geometry of watching. Plant your feet in the night, hands in your pockets. Triangulate those elbows. Tense up the hypotenuse of each arm. Finger on the trigger of a gun in every pocket. Misters one, two, three, and four. Stand in front, halfway between a huddle and a posse, a pie slice away from parallel. And one of you, Mr. Five, can lag behind. Just that space, and we'll know you're suspicious. Out of frame, the light source is set to stun you full in the face as the horizon cuts you off at the knees. It's working now, guys. Look at the light directly. Give us your longest shadows. Uh, this is actually the, the ep this is not the epigraph for this poem. It's the epigraph for this section of, of my book, Speaking Parts. The section is called Subtext. But it's a, it's a great little epigraph to sort of launch you into the poem I'm going to read next. It's from Dorothea Lang from this, um, this great documentary called Grab a Hunk of Lightning. And the epigraph goes this way. The work is the process of getting lost. Sometimes you annihilate yourself. Beside myself with... I'd killed off two, maybe three of myself, stuffed them in the broom closet. Why not the crawl space, I wonder? Closets are the first places they look. What it felt like to kill, I don't remember. Except in the bathroom with the cracked skylight, the roaches when I turned on the lamp to pee, the ants on the one cup I didn't rinse before bed. Only merely slightly against live and let live, slightly Buddhist fraud. On the lamb, I'm invisible in mirrored Ray-Bans when the noir version, where even the camera wields a scalpel framed for something you didn't do, see? Lights up my smartphone like a conscience. Run into the actress playing me. I try to avoid her. End up complimenting extravagantly. She's so self-possessed, knows about murders. Her unruffled hippie chic and underneath the floaty ruse, harsh as shit kicker boots. Much better at this scene. More than one of me thinks, honey, you can have the part. Hole up in Manhattan, try to blend in. Which who lives in this cold water flat? Up a steep and very sordid staircase, interior decorated in paisley squalor, didn't Dee Dee turn me on to this hideout? I play shell-shocked, as happens in times like these, when words don't spit it out, work. Plus, I've never been good with faces. When I was who, what did I didn't do? I must belong here. Don't I keep coming back? I do. I do. Shit. I do. Eventually, one feels assaulted by disguise. Yeah, that, uh, as much as I love acting, um, it can take it out of you. I mean, when you play a character that suffers, it feels like real suffering. <laughs> The body doesn't really know any different. Um, my father, who was an actor, um, when he was, um, when I was younger, 
he played a lot of characters that got killed. He was a, he is Italian and he played a lot of gangsters and he was always getting killed, which meant that we kids couldn't watch him on TV because we would c- confuse him getting killed on screen and him getting killed in real life. And lo and behold, when I got old enough and became an actor, I got killed a lot too. So this is a, this is an experience I had making a movie called Letters from a Killer. And it's called Correcting for Death. I play this character, dead Judith, on the call sheet with a paint gun, a makeup specialist, and effects, sprays a dead person's face on my face, steady with brushes made of a single eyelash, hand mix color concoctions are applied, correcting for death, stria for co- coagulation under the skin, the mottled freckling of an overripe peach for blood splash, a sculpted bullet hole in my temple, an exit wound, weeping syrup out of my cheek. Grips remove the rear view mirror from the three quarter ton pickup where I am slaughtered, not for my sake, for the camera angle. I'm in an onion field. Gore drips off the shattered passenger side window. Brains puddle on the Naugahyde seat. Lunch isn't for hours. We'll be on this shot forever. (laughs) Yes, when you're in dead makeup, it's very hard to find someone to eat lunch with you at the at the break. (laughs) Um, Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm going to swing towards um, one of the poems I brought about my folks. Um, The motion picture and television home has a special place in my heart. In fact, a shout out to Jessica Coy, who was very helpful. We toured the place, they almost lived there. And then they got really too sick to move. Um, But this is a poem about my father, Al Ruscio. This is about his last audition. Show goes on for Al Ruscio. Do I look like a judge? Dad crosses his arms, gives me his left profile. I peel off the Kleenex from his chin, the nick stopped bleeding. He's on such a high, high dose of blood thinners. And the walk across the whole Warner Brothers lot is a test. We pass costume cops horsing around, dueling with red licorice whips. What are you, wise guys? He parries in his best three-piece suit, sweat clean through, and as if down a gang plank, he walks into casting, affecting a halting gait, buying time. His, hello, darling, once deployed to debonair effect, except today, he's rushing through lines, voice climbing an octave, heart pumping, a brakeless bicycle down a steep incline. Then whoosh, out the door, they hustle him. The hollow kudos fade, faint praise, escorting us into the outside heat. A touch of sandpaper roughs up his melodic voice. Let's sit. He can't stand. And everything around us is pretend. A grassy New England park, a band shell. We sit on a bench shaped like a whale, looking out, both audience and on display. There is the church. There is the steeple. Open the door. See, it's an exterior set, 
a white wall propped up on wooden elbows. Yeah, my dad was such a trooper. Even, even from his hospital bed, he was, he was um, delivering a soliloquy from Shakespeare. Now is the winter of our discontent. Um, let me read. Okay. So I did this uh, series called Vietnam War Stories. And um, I um, played one of the people who worked at the Vietnamese Saigon Embassy. Um, and the, the episode was about the fall of Saigon. And we, you'll hear, we shot it here in L.A. on an, an incredibly hot and unusually humid period of time, which made us feel like we were actually in Vietnam. And this, this poem um, is called Dirty Work, and it has an epigraph from Ocean Vuong. A helicopter lifting the living just out of reach. Dirty Work. Night air whipped up by whirring blades cools us. The whole shoot an atmospheric swamp invades this desert basin, thick, hot, sticky, like a dragon's exhale. At the location, an L.A. stand-in for the American embassy, old French architecture, green around the faucets, black mold that won't scrub off. We trudge through the plot, grease-painted, hair strategically oil-slicked up, smoke marlboros, and feel the heat equalize in our lungs. Now, the middle of the last night, we bless this loud, doorless 1975-era chopper. We can't hear anything anymore. We're leaving. Scream your head off, Vietnam. Real Marines, cast as Marines, won't stop pumping their toy rifles, barking, evacuate, move it, unass this place now. Takeoff feels like a giant standing up. The director says, you don't even have to act. Just let the gravity wash over you. Below us, the pitch blacks punctured with street lamps as we careen over the Hollywood freeway, oncoming headlights, rows of white and pre-dawn tails streak red in their brightness receding as after a long night of tripping, trails high on altitude or nothing at all, or after days on end of shooting the fall of Saigon. Never been in a helicopter before. On this Dramamine free ride, we're passing through the gates of nausea and pandemonium. We have to be leaving, but soon are tugged back by the unchecked cargo of wannabe refugees, their arms hooked onto the landing skids, causing a drag on the engine's motor, a baffled whirring, high-pitched and shrill, like the wailing cry of the useful birds of Vietnam, the cattle egrets and ox peckers that hang out in the grassy verges of airports who do dirty work, attending to the water buffalo, grooming them, pecking out ticks, grease, snot, mucus, earwax. It's how they're nourished, grazing on giants who tolerate them, violently shake them off, passively allow them back. Fugitives are shrugged off with a sharp bank, unlatching them, pitching them off to the long drop into the South China Sea, all of them flailing, then soaking wet, handed towels, then on the next take, dunked again, all of them extras, summarily wrapped off the set in bathrobes. 
on board. We feel the jolt of their departures like a convulsion, feel the chopper suddenly burst higher, severed from attachments, eclipsed by the score, Hendrix growling through, there must be some way out of here, as if he isn't already years and years in the ground. Every time you fly, look for useful birds, landless, they delight the sky. Uh, Marlon Brando was to men of my dad's generation, you know, the bomb. Um, he um, was an amazing actor, and of course, his life kind of devolved at the end. But on the night that he died, um, which was late, it was announced at 11 o'clock, I fell asleep on the sofa, and I woke up, and he was on TV. Um, I mean, it had been scheduled before he died. It was Last Tango in Paris. So this poem, which took me years to figure out how to write, came of that. Nameless in Paris. Off the steel la lace of Eiffel, I launch myself. And it's just a matter of angle, this flying, levitating, really, without strain. And next to me, on the night he's died, Marlon Brando flies too, right through French doors, cups his hand over my mouth, his face within my bite. No names here. Not one name. Brando, when beautiful, was a weary thug. I'm dreaming in cinema again, which is all I know of Paris, and I'm sick to death of gravity, the ache I feel where wings should be, I want to slough off the places where I'm known, the many rooms of my renown, summer picnics where I lugged a heavy coat, dipped not one toe in the water and woke up tethered to a map, never lost my way going home. Let me slip back into a bathwater night in this city of flight, let my body pour out easy, following the river I've heard runs through Paris, weightless, aloft, anonymous at last, among the French stars. And now you'll get to meet my mother. Um, my mother, well, let me just recite this poem. Part of a lifetime. Mom needs potassium. Bananas, I say. Then her line, it's true. And there we are again in a vaudeville routine. She smells like a perfume that's gone off and her timings shot. I did a heart attack on 7th Heaven, want to see? Take it easy, drawls the intake nurse. In the morning, she phones dad on her hospital orange juice can. Honey, good news. Overnight, I learned Japanese. Dr. Snows prescribes Dilantin, stat, the tall world, flat. That's what mom needs. By the matinee, she's down to two words. Another coincidence. The next day, she's a silent movie. On the third day of her hospital engagement, like champagne on court, mom talks for 14 hours, no intermission, speaking on the inhale to hold the floor, her clattering hands. I've always wanted to be ambivalent. She crows, careening in grand loop-de-loops of tirade. She is lucky, waiting for Godot, qua, qua, qua. And all day, as the meal trays pile up, and the sun changes, shifts with the moon. I watch her scale this huge monologue 
the biggest part she's ever had, persevering even after she's lost her audience. All save me, standing by. I know to go on for her. And I'm going to close with a love poem. In love night, as silence falls at the end of a night through which two people have talked till dawn, Adrian Rich. My parents, show folk, taking comfort in the progress they as dreamers might make, like to sleep in. There they are, about to meet backstage where it's most night. See their silhouettes lean in, their faces lit by blue gels. Dad signs his glossy eight by 10. Can you use me? His sure hand on her nape, mom shifting her hips slightly, yes, wanting, but not so fast. Time's a two-way proposition. Tomorrow, she will have to hold the receiver up to his ear. Playing the play end game and on and on, they will go all the way cross country by red eye, chasing midnight in a darkened, star-filled sky cabin, a flying room of souls made candescent on cue. The amber gobos will gild their newly old faces, expectant, holding their own, sleepless and stung with first light. Darken the room, don't we, for a candled cake? And for wishes, close our eyes. Well, thank you, Beth. Such a resonant, clear, and, and comforting reading. I love the poems for your parents. And I love that first poem you read. Thank you for talking about Nebraska. You being in <laughs> Iowa. And I really uh, loved your the authenticity of your acting poems. And you really brought... Uh, forefront the experience of what it means when you work as an actor and I would just we have one minute left to go uh, before we bring on Helena yes. I would just like to ask you uh, one question or two if we can do them both in one minute uh, <laughs> first of all when did you write your first poem number one and number two uh, what attracts you about the poetry form um Okay, so I'll do them in reverse order. I mean, I, I love poetry because it rewards the um, the intimate gaze. Uh, uh, you know, it requires a certain quality of attention uh, that, um, and there doesn't have to be a plot. Those are the the the, and I also say that when you're with a group of poets, the conversation quickly turns into something deep. And I very much love, you know, being around poets and talking that way. Um, it's, it's, you know, fills my heart. And I, um, I mean, I've, I talk about my life as a poet as I've, I've probably always been a poet, but most of what I was writing kind of stalled like a weather system um, and, and didn't, you know, result in precipitation. I walked into Laurel Ann Bogan's poetry class at um, UCLA Extension Writers Program. And she said to me one day after class, you're a poet. And it changed my life. Well, you, you changed our life. And it's wonderful being with you. And our next poet, Elena Cardona. Elena Cardona is a poet and actor the recipient of over 20 hour honors and awards, including the Independent Press Award, International Book Award, and Hemingway Grant. Her books include Life in Suspension and Dreaming My Animal Selves, Salmon Poetry, and the translations Burnham Wood by Jose Manuel Cardona, Beyond Elsewhere by Gabriel Erno Lojak. Pardon my uh, pronunciation, and Walt Whitman's Civil War writings for Whitman Webb. Her work has been translated into 16 languages. She holds a master's in American literature from the Sorbonne, worked as a translator for the Canadian Embassy, and taught at 
Hamilton College, and LMU. Her acting credits include Chocolat, one of my favorites, Ford versus Ferrari, Star Trek Picard, The Hundred Foot Journey, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Happy Feet 2, and Serendipity. Elena Cardona's imaginative, Elena Cardona is imaginative and has a splendid use of language. I love the concision, clarity, spirituality in her poetry. Her poem, Low Altitude, is transcending. Quote, your wingspan lifts me. I empty myself of sadness. Such is the power of storms, end of quote. Her poetry can be a song, a prayer, a love poem. She begins to Kitty who loved the sea and Somerset mom with quote, the angel who smells of my childhood, my mother, end of quote. And later quote, this morning as I woke, the scent of gardenias whispering, I never left you, end of quote, a loving, poignant poem. Here's a brilliant poet, Elena Cardona. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Harry, for having me, for inviting me. And uh, what a treat, uh, Beth, to read with you and Jennifer and being an actor and a poet. It's it's really a... Uh, uh, a huge honor um, to to be here uh, for the Motion Picture Television Fund. Actually, I, I was in contact um, for a friend of mine trying to help him possibly move there. So um, it's quite synchronistic. And so, yeah, my two loves, um, poetry and acting um, together here uh, with everyone. So thanks so much for joining us. I... Um, Really, the the spiritual aspect of uh, of uh, of my life and and that my poetry is imbued with uh, came about um, really when very early on because I it's one of the reasons I actually ended leaving Europe uh, to come to the U.S. because I wanted to pursue acting and I had very little support originally uh, at home. And uh, and I really hovered between life and death at one point, and um, and out of that came uh, an immense strength that has you know kept me going. Because as we know, uh, the successes are, are wonderful, the highs are very high, and the lows are very low uh, in our profession. And and we need to have something to sustain us. And poetry has sustained me in a in a beautiful, magical way. And and my mother uh, has been a great supporter of mine uh, from the beginning. And um, my father uh, was a poet, and so I was very privileged also to to be able to uh, to translate his work. He's uh, uh, I, I think one of the greatest poets. Um, so I'll, I'll also read a, a poem of his that I translated from the Spanish. My collections are bilingual because uh, actually English is my fifth language. Um, I, I fell in love with it and it became <laughs> my dominant language. But my uh, first language is French, my native uh, tongue. And uh, well, French and Spanish, but mostly French. And so I... I'm writing my uh, poetry collections in both English and French. So I write them in English and then I translate them into French and then I go back to English and it's a dance between the languages. So uh, Life in Suspension, which is La Vie Suspendue, and uh, it has the one language, uh, the French on the one side and the English on the other. And so I'll start with that poem that uh, Harry beautifully quoted, uh, dedicated to my mom. She passed away in 96. And I really um, feel like she's never left me. I always feel her presence. And um, yes, it has an epigraph by E.E. E. Cummings. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. To Kitty, who loved the sea, and Somerset Mom. The angel, who smells of my childhood. My mother, piano and oboe, whose face the icon reflects auburn hair like a Modigliani, eyes the color of rain, light caught by surprise, whose presence the absence reveals, whose laughter burns snow, 
whose warm breath I breathed this morning as I woke, the scent of gardenias whispering, I never left you. And here's a poem um, called Woodwork. If I could gather all the sadness of the world, all the sadness inside me into a gourd, I'd shake it once in a while and let it sing. Let it remind me of who I used to be. Bless it for what it taught me and stare at it lovingly for not seeping out of its container. Um, I'm going to read a poem, the title poem of the book, uh, Life in Suspension. I grew up all over Europe, um, lived in different countries. I went to school in, in England as well. I um, studied and lived in Germany and uh, in Spain and Switzerland. I uh, spent my childhood there. And um, my mom was from Greece. And so we spent time there as well. And I, I uh, spent some time in Italy. So. I'm really a melting pot. I'm the daughter of immigrants. My dad was Spanish, my mom Greek, and I am myself an immigrant and really found a home in, in the US. So life in suspension. Let me introduce myself. I'm the memory collector, your companion and spirit guide. Let's unwind the clock, peel the past. The reflections you give me, conjure, surrender from within, I throw into the fire the cauldron of resolutions. They burn into embers and flickers that evolve into butterflies. They flutter away, heal and free you of all chains so they can revisit and reinvent who you are. Let's the dance begin. I'm in my mother's womb in Paris. She's scared. I want to get out. I'm three years old in Terracina, Italy sharing a room with four girls. My grandfather visits from Greece. He holds my brother on his lap and says, a boy at last, I'm not impressed with girls. I'm four years old in Monte Carlo. My mom takes me to school. A pigeon poops on my scarf. She reassures, it brings good luck. I'm five years old in Carpen, Germany. It's St. Nicholas Day, my birthday. Marie-Louise feeds me Lebkuchen, Stollen, and Pepfernusen. They taste like heaven. I'm six years old, in ballet class, in Geneva, breaking my point shoes. The Russian master ingrains in me the correlation between pleasure and pain. I now know the two centers sit next to each other in the brain. I'm seven years old, in the Swiss Alps, making snowmen, skiing, hunting for Easter eggs. My mother laughs then says, your father can't be left alone. I'm eight years old in the Jura mountains, in love with my dog, playing chess with my dad. I'm ecstatic. I'm nine years old. My grandmother takes me to the market in Tarragona to buy the bitter and pungent quince she craves. I'm 10 years old. My cousin drowns me in the beautiful blue waters of the Spanish Mediterranean because I threw sand at him. My head hits the hard bottom. All the air's gone from my lungs. My last thought is, no one knows I'm here. I'm 11 years old. My mother makes jam with apricots, strawberries, peaches, and plums. She's filled the house with the intoxicating scent of gardenias. My brother throws a temper tantrum. I'm 12 years old in math class, mad with laughter. I'm 13 years old. The music conservatory in Geneva is sheer magic, an enchanted world I inhabit alone, the key to my soul. My piano teacher has such faith in me. I'm 14 years old between worlds. My aunt married a fascist. He grabs my dad by the throat. It's the middle of the night. It's loud. I can't sleep. I'm 15 years old in Northern Wales, riding a fabulous horse along stunning steep cliffs, racing him to a full gallop in, be in the bewitching Celtic wind, relinquishing cravings in the dust. I'm 16 years old, 
off to San Diego. My mother cries at the Paris airport. She breaks my heart, but the pull is stronger. I'm learning to let go, trust the rightness of the moment, that everything happens at the right time. To appreciate what I have, I'm connected to my bones, filled with the richness and texture of space, uplifted, vibrating, reverberating, I become the sound of Tibetan bells echoing and hovering in the cosmos. I perceive the whole world below, life in suspension. I am going to read another poem dedicated to my mother. And many of the poems in my my books come from dreams. And that's a gift. I, I've always had uh, many dreams and vibrant dreams, and I haven't always known what to do with them. And um, one of my acting coaches in New York, Sandra Sikat, that many of them, of, uh, many of you, of you know, because Sandra is just one of the most, most amazing, one of the greatest coaches ever. And she uses dream work uh, for actors, right, for us to. Um, tap into our characters um, from a very uh, deep way, in a very deep way, of, of, with a very deep connection to the character. So we would write a letter to our inner self before going to sleep, you know, have a pad, a notebook next to the bed. And, and the dream would bring a clue, you know, as to the character, something unique to us for us to inhabit the character. And that's really a uh, very magical wor- work. Also, if you happen to not remember your dream, you pay attention to the day, and that's the waking dream. And something unusual, a surprise happens during the day, and that's also a clue. And so I've kept doing that work, you know, ever since then, and I've deepened that work, and I also use shamanic work for dream work, and so now that's actually work that I do myself as well. And... So many of the poems in this book and in my other collection, Dreaming My Animal Selves, come from the dream world. And this is a poem in which the Celtic goddess Seridwen came to me and, and she was both, you know, the sorceress, the, the Celtic goddess and my mother at the same time. My mother, Seridwen, the light on the icon, the way I see her in my dreams, the core of her, at the edge of darkness, in a magic cauldron always full, never exhausted, that brings her back to life, guarded by a golden serpent, coiled in the shape of an egg, the world snake marshalling inner reserves, the seed of a new journey, a glimpse of a mysterious and elusive woman crowned with morning glories. This is how she lands on the page. Slanted, looking out in space, integrated within me, save the blue sky across her face. So now I'm going to read um, a poem, um, About also about my life called uh, with peripatet- peripatetic Kremlin, with uh, an epigraph by Jeffrey Hill. Some days, a shadow through the high window shares my prison. My life is a slideshow, projecting the same image again and again, a glimpse into a world full of light from behind bars a world that escapes north and south as I stare at the angel, transfixed, blinded by the whiteness of time. Um, And here's another one, and as actors, we can all relate to that. A house like a ship. I live in a house like a ship at times on land, at times on ocean. I will myself into existence, surrender 
invite grace in. I heed the call of the siren. On the phantom ship, I don't know if I'm wave or cloud, undine or seagull. Lashed by winds, I click, I cling tight to the mast. Few return from the journey. I now wear the memory of nothingness, a piece of white sail wrapped like second skin. And here's another um, poem dedicated to my mother. It's called Twisting the Moon, and it has an epigraph by Hafiz. Now is the time to know that all you do is sacred. We shared the coast of Maine in June. Hundreds of whales, lobster sandwiches, buttermilk pancakes, and a room in Bar Harbor with antique bathtub. There now a cloister of shadows loved, goldsmith of the music of time. She left when circumstances met. I dream of offering her strawberries on sacred moons, healed by the beauty of memories, ready to start over as knowing nothing. Um, I'm going to read the last poem of the book, which is, I love magic, I love fairy tales, I love to live in an enchanted world and to create magic. So it's called Spellbound. Fall asleep at the lake tonight, no boundaries like a fairy. I'm the eagle song, a calling, light defying gravity, someone to steal horses with, a case of mistaken identity, tears transforming into fish in the air, a force that propels forward, proclaims who I am with a passport from God, her will and explosion with bullets for words. I offer you everything, stardust, silence, impish grace, and flutes like birdsong, mischievous, good and bad, pulled out of myself into the spell. I ask the unthinkable, move so fast, breathless, delicate craftsmanship. I walk on all fours, elongated, neither human nor animal, a creature you only see in magic. So now I'll read a poem from... Um, one of my other books, uh, Dreaming My Animal Selves, which has a beautiful cover illustration from a Welsh artist, Jackie Morris. And this poem is how it works out with dreams. Dreams like water. I trace patterns in dreams through beings disguised, undone like particles broken apart, revealing pieces of me. I pursue elusive sleep in the hope to heal mishaps, the last chance to anchor my boat. And this is from the heart with grace. Wind, who yearns to be savored, offers me three cups overflowing with eternity, daemon of insight. The opportune encounter enraptures Quintessential distress, ruffles a strange quietude, kindles a je d'esprit, glücklicher Reise, propels the fragrance, the fervent fragrance of heliotrope, hyacinth, and honeysuckle. The tremulous hibiscus taunts me to warm climates, reminds me I remain a thistle, resilient, rooted in Mediterranean Celtic French. Do you remember? a language older than time, when a shiver down my mother's spine was worth a, a thousand words, and the melancholy in my father's eyes refle reflecting Lake Geneva was indecipherable. There, unbeknownst to me, 
in a world inhabited by swans, I too swim in concentric circles to find the resonance of my core and discover that in dreaming lies the healing of earth. In dreaming, we travel to a place where all is forgiven. In dreaming is the divine created. And um, I'll close, um, I think that it should be my last poem, but you'll, you'll tell me, Harry, with a poem. So this is a translation from um, my dad's poetry. It's from a book called Burnham Wood, and it's also bilingual, Spanish, um, Spanish, English, and this time. And uh, this is a book that the, uh, my dad was from the island of uh, Ibiza in Spain, and um, the government of Ibiza paid him a tribute in, uh, in 2007, uh, and uh, published this anthology of his work um, to thank him. And, uh, you know, the, the reason I actually was born in France is because my dad had to leave Spain because of Franco's dictatorship, so as not to be arrested for his writing. So uh, they are very thankful to him in, in Ibiza for, um, for, he, for everything he did. So this is called Poem, um, the first Part of the book are poems dedicated to the sorceress Circe. So this is poem to Circe 9. Humanly, I'm illuminated. I am amazed every day by the roaring song that overflows like corrosive, like erosive blackberry juice, by the joyful, by the joyful and boisterous song of men. Voices stretch like branches, footprints like branches, Flesh kindred to my flesh, and life's juicy wind ripens. I reincarnate with their centuries-old footprints, their secular voices, their joy so often painful, like a sick child carried on one's back. Oddly, it's on this island, Circe, I have the strength to live. Here, humanity is embraced and screams, mixing laughter with its colors, speaking the same language with varied accents. Love's display becomes a ritual we officiate. We arrived and the miracle happened. It was the sea and, a, and the wind in the bells. We came from far, from yours thirsty as dust, from humble fishermen's nets on barren shore. We arrived and the miracle with us. It jumped into the net like liquid fish and multiplied for all. And we satiated ourselves and all of us, we all walk through the sand as one. You see, Circe, the miracle occurs whenever man wants it. The search, that is the mystery of all things. Oh, what a so. beautiful reading. Thank you, Helena. I just love the... I love your willingness to take on other identities outside of yourself, to go deep into the dream world. And, and we live in a time where there's so much political correctness and people say you can't take on this identity and that, but through the imagination, you have shown us uh, that you can, and you have such a, uh, a sense of the divine creative and you've really enchanted us and illuminated us with your worlds that you have lived in not only in the external world, but also in the interior world. And, you know, I just love your poems for your mom and for your dad and for all the places that you've, you've been. And, uh, you know, such, you have such depth. And I just wanted to, um, to ask you a, a question uh, just on the poetry before I ask you the same questions that I asked Beth is, are you a Jungian? Yeah, I, I am. I actually, um, uh, a lot of the work I do is Jungian work, but I also um, uh, do shamanic work. And so, you know, this ability to, this, you know, to inhabit multiple selves, which as actors, we do, we have to, it's always us, right? But through uh, others. And so, um, uh, so yes, the union, uh, the union, in a way, it's like the whole world is 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 a reflection of you, right? That's uh, my approach. Well, thank you. And I'll ask you the same two questions I asked Beth. When did you write your first poem, and what attracts you 
about the poetry form? Yeah, I write. I wrote my first poem when I was ten, so very early on. Uh, who knows? You know, that's it, it. It just happened. It just came to me, and and what what I found is that writing poetry for me is 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 very healing. And in a way, it's it's really what the arts are about. You know, it's the same with acting. It's very healing. We we heal ourselves first. You know, when we express ourselves uh, through the arts, whether it's 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 film, acting, poetry, painting, music, and then we heal others, and and because they recognize you know themselves through the art as well. It's a reflection. Of them, we each found ourselves in 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 all the creations. So that's my approach to it. it. It's it's a way to express myself and to transmute pain into into beauty, you know. And so I I, I first do it for myself foremost. It it it's uh, it just brings me tremendous um, joy and and fulfillment. And then I love to share it, uh, you know, to put it out into the world and, and to share it with others, because I have benefited so much from from reading and and from you know watching movies, plays, um, music concerts, listening to music. I mean, one of my first experiences in the theater was was just transcendent. You know, I just the play was. My parents had a we had a subscription to to a few theaters, you know, in Paris. And uh, I just remember, like, I, I didn't have the words for it, but, but I was transformed, you know. And that was when I think the first seed was planted. And, and I just, you know, have been reading my whole life. I, 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 I love to read and, and, and you inhabit so many worlds through reading as well. And it's very enriching. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a word I was going to use, enriching. and. Uh, you know, Beth mentioned about how this is an hour, a time out of time. And I felt that today, as I always do, when poetry is good and it really, um, it just deepens our sense of each other and, and uh, connective, how we connect with each other. And, you know, very optimistic reading from both of you. And we have, as Jennifer said, we have some time. So, you know, we can talk about whatever we want to talk about, I guess. Since oh. we're, it is a poetry show, but since we are all actors, why don't we talk, uh, let's just talk about, uh, you know, I, I remember seeing uh, a play Beth was in years ago called The, uh, the Shaper, and it was written by John Stepling. And it was really an unusual form. It was not the ordinary conventional form, but it was very uh, indicative of really the, the lifestyle of surfers, and in this case, a surfer and the, the people around him. And how did you feel, Beth, about acting in that play? And uh, a, a minor question is what, maybe it's not minor, but another question is what happened? Where is John Stepling these days, you know? I know, yes, I, I do know. Uh, I know a lot. Um, let's see. So The Shaper, which debuted at a little small theater in downtown LA called the Night House um, long ago. Um, in fact, when John wrote it, um, I, I was a company member of the Padre Hills Playwrights Festival, and that's where I met John. And um, when John wrote it, he, he didn't have a typewriter, so he hand wrote it all in his own little, um, very small capital letters uh, across the page and Xeroxed it. I think ultimately I typed it up for him, but I still have that handwritten copy. And to be in that play, which was very, um, which was really about the underbelly of Los Angeles. This was in the eighties. And it was pretty unique at that time for the theater to approach that subject matter, um, especially about LA and he was from LA. And it was, you know, uh, there were some, you know, nasty parts of it and very rugged um, kind of world that he was talking about. The hallmark of his work remained, because I did four productions of his plays, four, four productions in a row. And the hallmark of his plays is the, the way in which he's playing with time, which is very much 
like poetry. He slows time down so that you are, so that the smallest gesture got an enormous amount of shebang. Um, there was, and it made audiences uncomfortable watching that play. And people would, you know, go, oh, and then just like walk out, which John, <laughs> you know, thought was great. It was great that, you know, people got so affected by it that, you know, whether they loved it or hated it, that he, he loved it, you know, you got a rise out of people. Um, John is in Norway. <laughs> John is in Norway now. He has twin sons, and I think he has a new kid too. He has a Nor a Nor Norwegian wife. Um, he has a grown son that lives in this country, Al 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 Alexis. Um, and I think, and I know he's a grandfather too. In fact, I think his latest, his newest children are younger than his grandchildren. Um, so he is, uh, he continues to write and work. In fact, he came, ironically enough, he was in town on the day that Kobe Bryant was killed. On that morning, he invited me to come to this workshop that he was holding in, um, what's that part of town called Frog Hollow or something like that near Koreatown? Anyway, um, there was all this scuttlebutt on the radio and I said, oh my God, you guys. Kobe, it looks like Kobe Bryant been, has been killed. So his, um, which is a horrible, I don't mean to gloss over that. It was an absolutely horrible day. Um, but John was in town to reconnect us and really has never lost connection with the LA theater scene. There are a lot of people you'd call them the deeply affected by John as a playwright in Los Angeles and other playwrights that have come up, up like, Kelly Stewart and Robbie Bates and um, and on a lot of people. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm amazed, Harry, that you saw that play. It's just astonishing to me that you saw it, really. And thank you so much. I I would get recognized for that play for years to come, and I was astounded that, you know, even all the movies and television I've done, it's been that work on stage in L.A. that has people you know, saying, hey, you're that girl. You're that <laughs> bad girl. <laughs> I remember that very vividly. And it's one of the best book plays I've ever saw by a Southern California playwright. I think the last play of his I saw was Lion's Roar, if that's correct. It was it took place along a railroad track. And I yeah, was, that, yeah, he, you know, I mean, here's a little side thing. He gave me my first he gave me my first poetry book, which was called News of the World. It was a, it was a compendium. Robert Bly, I think, edited it, and it was just full of, um, it's a really rare volume, actually. I remember I brought it into a David St. John workshop once, and he went, where did you get that? So John, <laughs> John, was, John used to say to me, and this will dovetail into, I don't mean to hog the floor, but it'll dovetail into our conversation, John Stepling used to maintain that the, all the best playwrights were poets. <laughs> you know, he, I think he wrote, you know, one film he wrote, 52 Pickup, as exactly. I remember. Exactly. And uh, I also remember he was a junkie. And, uh, yep. you know, that, was, that may be some of the darkness that you were talking about. I don't know, maybe that was off camera. But uh, you both, uh, thank you for all that info. And the, both of you have had such a wonderful poet of uh, parents. And let's ask Helena, I mean, I'm amazed, Helena, about your, you know, all the different worlds that you went through as a growing up in Europe. And it just really, um, you know, it's very, uh, you know, I don't know what the word would be, informative to me because, uh, you know, to be able to do all that in the five languages, what, um, what let's just get back to you a minute about acting, if I, if I may, before we get back to poetry is, what a, what was um, I? Uh, what are? What did you first begin acting, Helena? Yeah, you know it's really strange because when I was living living um, uh, in Switzerland or or and then next to Switzerland in the mountains, you know, um, uh, my childhood my childhood. I was born in Paris and we moved right away to Switzerland and Monte Carlo and back to Geneva and then at the foot of the mountains. Uh, the uh, regular uh, programming at school uh, uh, 
was was changed at one point uh, for something experimental and so when I was 10. And so I took acting out of nowhere. And, and then it went back to normal. And because I was um, very good at everything and I was very good at math, uh, what ended happening, we moved to Paris, um, back to Paris when I was 14, even though, you know, I was a musician and I was a dancer as well, you know, through the music conservatory in Geneva and then in Paris as well, I continued uh, uh, studying the piano with a master and, and I was part of a dance company. But because I was good at math too, in addition to languages and French and, and whatnot, uh, selection in France is through math. And so I, I ended naturally uh, going into the uh, scientific section, you know, in high school, as they call it, where you do everything else. And I, I had Latin as well. I had seven years of Latin, with, but with a v very heavy focus on, on, on math and physics and, and uh, you know, that. that. <laughs> so uh, I, I got into med school at 17 and, and it was brutal because I found out that it was really not possible to maintain everything like I, as I thought I, I I hoped I, I could and would, because, you know, when you're young, the whole world is like was open to me. I just thought, oh, I could do anything I want. And then I found myself in med school and already it was pretty brutal. These um, last three years of high school where you just, you know, focus so heavily. It's like you you study the whole time and then you're in med school and it's even you know more brutal. And I was still interested in languages, you know, during the summers and I was still trying to keep playing the piano and dancing. And I found out after two years of that that I burned out and I had a, 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 a I fell into a very deep depression, because, which almost killed me. And uh, and which was really, you know, the universe saying to me, you know, you just you just can't do that. And and I knew I wanted to act. And that's really when I uh, decided I'm, I'm going to become an actor. And what I did at the same time is I, I, I still um, wanted to uh, pursue a degree uh, uh, in literature because I just loved reading. And for me to, to read and, and take exams about, you know, novels was just not really difficult homework. <laughs> so, you know, I did that, but uh, I ended really having to move to New York to pursue acting because like I said, even though my mother was supportive, my daddy took him a little while to come around. And, um, and again, I, 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 I fought for my life and I, I decided to, to just leave Europe behind, um, uh, you know, and, and just focus on acting, which is really what I wanted to do. And, and uh, there's this, uh, you know, I wrote my master's um, on Henry James, the search for fulfillment. And that's really the theme throughout my life. We each have a theme. And, uh, and, um, and, and sometimes the, the, the thing that calls you, you know, is, is hard because you have, you have, um, sometimes it's for, for some people, they know right away when, let's say, when they're very, very young as a child, that, that's one thing they want to do and they pursue and they pursue that and that's it. And that's fantastic. And for me, it was a very torturous, uh, in a way, journey, but very enriching at the same time, because now everything has been coming together. And so I, I started a new life in New York and I thought I was going to train the American way. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and I thought when I graduate from that, I'll come back to Paris. But once I was in New York, I was home. I just did not want to leave. And um, and that was also a journey in terms of like, you know, I, I, I went there with a student visa and then I had to get a practical training visa, which I think I was the very first uh, student from the American Academy to achieve that. And then I got a, a, a working visa that was renewed. And then I got um, the green card in the lottery the second time I tried it. So I felt, okay, fate is on my side <laughs> or destiny or, you know, like I'm getting a little help along the way. And, you know, and now I'm also a citizen. I've become an American citizen. Um, after, you know, you have five years of the green card, you can apply for citizenship. And so I feel very at home and um, I'm very lucky uh, that I've been able to support me from my acting work. You know, um, I think only 3% of actors uh, can do that. And that's really thanks to all my languages because I do um, a lot of voices. 
for TV shows and uh, and movies in all. I work with all my six languages, and I'm very grateful for the work um, because, as you know, it it comes and goes, and you and you just never know. Like you know, I at one point I I, I got a movie with uh, Lawrence Kasdan. Mumford and and a series, the New Adventures of Robin Hood, that was filming in Lithuania, and right on the heels of that, I got Chocolat, and then I was up for the lead role in The Count of Monte Cristo, and I didn't get it, and I don't know. It seemed like oh, after Chocolat, you know, like and no, there was like kind of a lull. It was really odd, and that opening basically enabled me to reconnect with my writing and the poetry, and that's how the books you know, came to, came to be. And so you have to be very grateful for everything because you never know um, why something doesn't happen at the time and, and everything cyclical, you know, so it's, I'm, I'm just so grateful for the books and for the poetry and, and for, for having uh, that richness in my life. And like Beth, I, there's a, a great poet who's uh, also a wonderful teacher in Los Angeles, David St. John, uh, with yeah. whom, who's a friend and with whom I've taken many workshops as well. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I've taught myself that the teachers are wonderful. I think they just, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for all the teachers in my life. And, and now for being able to, uh, you know, live in, in all these worlds simultaneously. So I, you know, I, I, I have the, the poetry and the books and the acting, and I translate as well. I translate other poets. I've translated uh, at least a dozen poets. And um, uh, right now, I've, I've been translating a, um, a Syrian poet, a Franco-Syrian poet, Maram al-Masri, who, um, who's from Syria and has, you know, uh, exiled herself in France, and, uh, and, and, and she's wonderful. So... Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, I, I, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> it reminds me what you were talking about. Uh, you had some, a line, I'm probably not getting it exactly right, but something like everything happens at just the right time. And then also, you know, talking about your journey, there's a, my, my late wife, Holly Prado, she uh, went to a Jungian for many years, two of them that I know of. And the last one, uh, she would talk to her every month and they would talk about her dreams. And, uh, mm -hmm. and there's also something in the Jungian world where Jung said something that we find our journey on the road we chose, we find our destiny on the road we chose not to take. And uh, it's <laughs> mm -hmm. there. And then the other thing, you know, about all of us here being actors and poets, you know, my wife and I, we used to always say that, you know, living in LA, uh, you know, everybody, you know, Hollywood, you know, the movies, TV, and music overshadows poetry. And we always used to say, like, we're, we poets, we're the mutants. And, and, and then, you know, as you pointed out, the healing aspect of poetry. And also what I found, you know, uh, where poetry helped me, at least one thing, many, you know, obviously there are many more, but when I work as an actor, it really helps me to use time and space in a good way because we learn that, you know, on the page. And, uh, you know, movies cost so much, we have to be ready, uh, you know, every way we can when, the, you know, we show up on the set then. What are, uh, what are some of the uh, poets that, let's start, go back to Beth and then to Helena, what are some of the poets in the past that, uh, that you like and that have influenced you? Well, wow, I mean, like, like Helena, I am, um, and I'm, and I'm so glad. Um, I loved what you just said, Helena. I'm just, I'm just absorbing it. Um, I really, uh, I can relate to the idea of dream. I have a very big dream life, so it's. Uh, and since I've been a poet now, um, I mean, I guess I give myself permission to, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and start, you know, because I'll get inspiration and I'll just start writing. So that's the wonderful thing. You can't really, you know, you can't really get up in the middle of the night and act by yourself. So <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful to have something to do. If something wakes you up, you can actually do something with it. Um, the poets I love. Well, um, here's here are the poets that I always read. Um, Adrian Rich. Elizabeth Bishop, 
I can tell you that, right, and I read a lot of women poets. Um, the w- books I'm reading now are by Diane Seuss, a book called Frank, which is all sonnets. Um, Gail Ronsky, Under the Capsized Boat We Fly. Alicia Partnoy, Volando Bolito. Um, the reason I'm reading her is that I'm going to interview her for a project at LMU, uh, Alicia Partnoy. Argentinian, one of the disappeared, survived. Amazing, amazing poet, amazing woman. Um, David St. John's poetry is fabulous, the way in which he kind of remakes himself every book. None of his books are really alike. You know, what he try, what he's doing in Prism, you know, uh, is different from what he did in Red Leaves of Night, for instance. Um, B.H. Fairchild, Pete Fairchild, if you know him, you can call him Pete. Um, The Art of the Lathe, which was the book that he wrote when he was, when he just was like, I can't just cut, I can't cut a break. So I'm just going to write the book I want to write. And then that ended up being the book that made him known. Um, He's a great, he was a great, you know, um, inspiration to me. Natasha Trethewey, um, brilliant poet. Natasha Trethewey, Terrence Hayes. Um, Natasha Trethewey, great poet, but her book right now, her memoir about her mother, her mother who was killed by her stepfather, is just so moving. I highly recommend it. And um, Terrence Hayes' is, um, American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassins is also, um, you know, an amazing book. Um, he wrote those that book in the first I think, 200 Days of the Trump Administration. Um, Dorian Locks, uh, Larry Levis, um, Wieslawa Zimborska, Polish, Polish poet. Um, yeah, it's like, uh, I try to just read, I mean, I'm a, ver- <laughs> it's like, Harry, we could be here at like till, till till tomorrow at this time. I'm a voracious reader, just like Helena. I just, I mean, if you could see what you can't, you know, what's not on <laughs> camera, I am surrounded by, there's a desk here with books. There's a little table over here with books. I'm looking at a shelf full of books. Um, I just love books. Um, and movies is my other love. <laughs> it's mutual. And uh, Helena, what are some of your poets that you love in the past. Yeah, yeah. First, I, I'll uh, absolutely agree with with Beth, everyone she's mentioned, and so many of them are actually friends as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, definitely uh, Dorian Locks. Actually, I have translated her uh, into mm. French, and uh, one of Wonderful. my, uh, yes, uh, it's a book called uh, What We Carry in English. Yes which I translated into French, Ce que nous portons, mm. published by Edition du Signe in Paris, beautiful French editor. And uh, yes, I love her. And um, uh, Lee Upton, beautiful poet. She's also a novelist. Uh, Sidney Wade, uh, these are contemporaries that I'm adding you know, to the mix. Um, and, and actually my partner, John Fitzgerald, who's, who's a great poet and wonderful editor, and who has such a, a keen eye, like he's, I always have him read, you know, what I write. And actually, um, I've uh, been published and uh, have reviewed for this uh, amazing, this one of the, the best uh, literary journals called A World Literature Today. And, uh, and John was selected also as, as, you know, one of 100 poets to, to, uh, uh, who've had a, a, a profound impact, you know, uh, Louise Glick, you know. Uh, oh yes, yes, um, and and you know, uh, going back to William Blake, to uh, uh, Rilke, uh, they they stay with us forever, right? Uh, uh, John Berryman. Uh, Shakespeare is a great poet, like the plays, like what Beth was saying, you know, and that's what uh, the theater and poetry have in common is concise language and a lot of packed emotion in, 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 in fewer words than I love novels too, obviously, you know, but that's, that's the, I think that the core of, of poetry and, and, um, and uh, plays uh, share that as well. 
um, yeah, I mean, so many. I, I just could could go on for <laughs> for hours as well. Uh, that was just um, Emily Dickinson, uh, and I'm so glad that they made a series uh, based on Emily Dickinson, which is you know the merging of of, of poetry and 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 uh, and TV, which is like film. Um, it's beautifully shot. Um, well, and and Harry did a program of all of Emily Dickinson in chronological order, right, Harry? Well, we didn't do all of them. How many other? 1789, something like that. Oh, well. We did but, what we could fit in. We did quite, I think we did 45 in an hour, which is quite a bit. You know, uh, this show is really about you two, and I'm learning so much about you, and uh, you've given us such great poetry and also some wonderful books to read. For myself, you know, the last couple of years, <clears throat> excuse me, I uh, talking about translators, David Ferry, He's translated four books that I really love, two of them by Horace, the, uh, the Odes of Horace and then the Epistles of Horace and then Georgics and the, uh, another one by Virgil. And uh, I really love him as a translator. And I go back and read, uh, especially the Odes. Uh, you know, I've reread that book four or five times and it's just such a, you know, taking elemental ordinary things and uh, writing about them. And, you know, so I really love him. and I. I, I I didn't start writing until I was 26, and I was uh, in New York City, and I began writing, and I went back I I went back and learned the tradition, which obviously each of us knows. There's anytime you know a field, there's so much you don't know. So I'm always learning more, and in our time, we've learned so much more than we did when I was growing up. When I was uh, in the fifth grade, I went to a country schoolhouse, and our teacher taught us the poetry of Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson, and I remember I memorized, oh, captain, my captain, <laughs> uh, stood up and recited it to my fifth grade class. But I was always glad to get those fundamental great mother and father of American poetry. And then, uh, so I'm always reading and, and learning too. And, you know, I think that uh, Helena used an important word, which I find happening to me all the time is healing. And, uh, you know, we all, being poets, you know, we, you know, you go back to the Orpheus myth, and just, you know, putting all the pieces back together, you know, the transformation, uh, you know, what the poet does, or even an actor. I mean, you're in a motel somewhere, and you've got many weeks work, and you've got all the scenes up on the wall, uh, trying to keep track, because, you know, we, both of you know well, we shoot out a sequence, but, you know, putting all the pieces together. And uh, so, you know, it's really an honor to have both of you here. We share so much, and it's just really, um, you know, because sometimes, you know, you feel lost. I mean, you know, everybody that I know, who I know, you know, when I came to LA in 1968, we all came here to make a living as an actor. And, uh, you know, many of us did. And so that's a tough thing to do. Uh, as Helena pointed out, the stats are uh, pretty uh, wide for the amount of people that try to work and the few people who do work. But it's really uh, great to listen to you both talk. We have a about five minutes left before Jennifer has to do a new show. And uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for your wonderful poetry. And second of all, I want to thank you for your generosity and for giving because as uh, both of you know, MPTF, this is its 100th anniversary and it's got quite the legacy. You know, I, I'm one of, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of actors who have been here and there are more to come. And uh, they teach the children, uh, you know, these people who contribute great sums they also teach their children the act of giving back. And that's another thing that, that we all learn too in, in the act of poetry is uh, kindness and also, bro you know, brotherhood, you know, sisterhood, you know, but uh, kindness and graciousness and including us all. And uh, more and more people in America, we are including, you know, that phrase in the, I believe it's in the Bill of Rights, in order to form a more per perfect union, we keep trying and we keep trying to do better. And we know there's a lot of work left to be done, but you two women have certainly enlarged my sense of, uh, of generosity and great poetry. And I see our wonderful, great uh, Jennifer Clymer there. Jennifer, what would you like to say? Uh, you, you've heard this and you've done so much great work in terms of giving to uh, MPTF, uh, Jennifer Clymer. Uh, I'm I'm grateful for the time that you have given us and for the artistry that you've shared, but I'm also grateful to know that 
MPTF has been part of your consciousness, part of your, your world and your family, because it is, it is not going to sustain for the next hundred years without the people who understand what the services are about and, and not only communicate that to others and support the, um, you know, the kind of tent pole that Mary Pickford put down for us, which is we see a need and we fill it. And PTF has, has adapted rapidly throughout the years. And I'd like to think that what we're doing here is just another form of that adaptation, that making sure that everyone understands creativity doesn't end when you're 65. <laughs> it never ends. <laughs> it, it never ends. It never ends. And the, the need to have that voice <coughs> expressed doesn't stop with, I've written it on paper. It is about getting it in front of people and connecting to the heart center of those that witness your acting or, or have the opportunity to hear or read what you have put down on the page. Um, and this is just an extension of that. What we're doing with Creative Chaos and with MPTF Studios in general is to make sure that the platform is still available to people in, in their retirement. There's nobody retires from creativity. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, I think of, I think of, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think of acting this way too, as well as poetry. It's a service industry. You know, it is essentially, you know, it, 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 it has to have readers, audiences in order to complete, you know, it's not, it's not in a vacuum. It has to exist to give to somebody, to give to somebody. And, you know, that's what they say. You give a performance. Um, you don't just hog it all yourself. So the what you are doing here at MPTF, and I've been a real recipient of your, uh, you know, there are other services that you have offered me personally, but I can say just in terms of my own family, um, the help that I got, especially from Jessica Coy, I keep saying her, C A. U G H E Y, I think is how you spell her name. That is correct. And it is and impossible to read that and pronounce it in the way that it should be pronounced. Yes. <laughs> well, because I had I dealt with her, but she yes. was so careful and so and she above and beyond went out of her way to help my parents. And um I just was so at a very, really rough time with both of them. And um I'm gonna change my camera. I'm I'm, quickly. I'm all for there what? she there she is. Oh, there she is. That's right. Hi, Jessica. <laughs> Please give her my best. I will. Please do. Yes. Yeah, and, I mean, and, uh, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you have bequests, right, for people who want to, not like I have a lot of money, but, I mean, I'd, <laughs> I'd love to be able to, like, give you whatever I have, and you may well see me there as an occupant as I get older. Well, that's wonderful, but volunteering like you have today doesn't have to start when you retire and live here. It, it is ongoing now. Yeah. I, I was going to chime in. It's uh, absolutely, and it's really all about connecting, I think, because this is a basic human need. And I always have this quote, uh, only connect from E.M. Foster, you know, on my uh, on my website, you know, the, the one who wrote uh, Howard's End. It's from Howard's mm. End. And um, beautiful movie by James mm. Ivory, right? Love Beautifully acted. But it's really all about connecting and even animals, right? Like we have that need, um, this animal and human need to connect and to stay connected. And I think for for everyone, even more so for actors, you know, the the, the, the fact to keep the creativity going and to stay connected to um, to our industry in many ways and, and 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 to people in general because you know it's not over until it's over it's like as long as you're there you serve a purpose basically and so I think it's for me it's such a gift to to be able to be here and with you and I so appreciate it I'm very thankful for it me too and none of it happens without without Harry. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Harry. Thank, Thank you, you Harry. so much. You're wonderful, Harry. I'm a I'm yeah. a groupie. <laughs> well, thank you both for really uh, uplifting my day and my my life. You've enriched my life, and 
it's time for Jennifer Clymer because we all know TV waits for no man or no woman. So, <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> 40 and 50 months day after day. So thank you, Elena Cardona and Beth Ruscio. And here's Jennifer Clymer. Thank you.